We're always telling your stories, and it's time someone tells ours. We're humans first, journalists second. We chose this career to give you a voice. Now we're voicing ours. It's true, journalism has much room for improvement, but not all hope is lost, and we want your trust back by humanizing one journalist at a time. We're sharing with you what we go through to bring you the news. The pain, the tears, the trauma, and the mental health struggles. It's painful, and sometimes we even work two jobs to make ends meet. But we all have something in common. The passion, the joy, and the love we feel for storytelling and holding the powerful accountable. That includes holding ourselves accountable. So here are stories from us. This is how we want to help improve the news industry. The Awakened Journalist is proud to present Media Healers by Emiliana Molina Fajar. Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us on The Awakened Journalist with a special project called Media Healers. Today we're going to be speaking to Vic Michelucci. He's an anchor and investigative reporter currently in market size 43 in Florida. He covers crime, justice, public safety, government, and the arts. And he's also a three-time Emmy Award winner. Vic has done some extensive coverage in some of the hardest hurricanes we've seen in Florida, like Matthew and Hurricane Irma, as well as Maria in Puerto Rico. He's also covered four presidential elections, mass shootings, homicides, a lot of pain. And um, among those mass shootings, he was in the Parkland shooting, covering it from beginning to end, as well as uh, Pulse nightclub, uh, Pulse nightclub, from the day the incident happened all the way to the court hearings. So, Vic, thank you for agreeing to speak with us, and welcome. Thank you. Certainly, awesome. been through a lot over the past twelve. A years. lot, yeah, a lot. It's a, a long career. Um, 12 years of being a journalist. How did that start? How did you decide to become a journalist? Well, I was always curious and I was always interested in how government worked, how police worked. If I saw firefighters going somewhere, I would ask my parents, hey, can we go there? Can we take a look? So I didn't know if I wanted to work in public service, if I wanted to be a first responder. I mulled about possibly joining the FBI, DEA, something like that. But I found out that journalism is a good way to get a taste of, of many different entities, see how they work, see how they operate, and, and still reach out to the people and tell stories and give a voice to the voiceless and, and shed light that maybe has not been shed on these important issues that affect all of us here in our communities. Yeah, I agree. That's amazing. Um, what has been, do you think, one of the most rewarding experiences in your career so far? Maybe a story you've covered that's helped generate positive change in your community? I think anytime you can make a difference and raise awareness that you are doing something right. We have gone into major apartment complexes, government housing, where people have had despicable, horrible living conditions we have been able to shine a light there and get the government and the property owners to come in and, and give these people and their family members a place to stay that is safe, that is sanitary, um, and is something that they can be proud of. Uh, we have been able to do stories where our reporting has led to arrests and tips and information all the way up to homicide arrests. So this has happened by us interviewing family members, by us keeping something in the public eye, by us releasing key pieces of evidence and surveillance video, we've been able to help the public see something and ultimately say something to police. Uh, and then there's always, in the wake of tragedy, you can shine a light on the need. I learned this when I went to Puerto Rico, when I was in the panhandle for the aftermath of Hurricane Michael, when I was in the Bahamas for the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, you can show what it's like, show the human suffering, show the human need. And over the years, we have gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more than a million dollars pledged to help people who are suffering and, and who really need it, no matter what the situation is, from fires, homicides to natural disasters, 
there are people that need certain resources. And when I'm down there reporting, even as recently as Surfside, people have reached out and they have said, I want to help out, whether it's water and towels and gloves for first responders or money to put people up as they wait for word on their loved ones. You know, there are still really good people out there and they can't donate if they don't know about the need. So my job is to let them know about the need and hopefully connect them with the people that need it the most. Vic, that's amazing. And you've, it sounds like you've had incredible experiences throughout the years, um, but it's not always easy being a, a witness to all these tragic events, mass shootings, hurricanes. Um, what do you think has been one of the hardest experiences that you've gone through as a journalist and, and how did you cope with the aftermath? You know, it's difficult. I started in this market at 22. I think I was five days out of college when I started. Congrats. My camera, <laughs> police scanner, working weekends, working overnight. I mean, there would be times when I'd see three homicides in an evening and you had to just move from murder to murder to murder meeting the families, seeing the families in pain, obviously seeing the crime scenes and the bodies, it takes a toll on you. And I've got to tell you, it certainly is something that you take home with you. And I think that if I never thought about it, then I would be concerned about my conscience because Certainly, when you go to something that is so tragic and so painful for so many people, you feel it too. And, or at the very least, I feel it. And it's hard to be living in a disaster zone like Puerto Rico after a hurricane or the Panhandle or the Bahamas, where there are so many people that have died, that are missing, have lost their homes, their livelihoods. It's hard to go back to normal life, right? And go back to your house and have a clean bed to sleep in and air conditioning and electricity and then get a nice meal. And the luxuries that we have can be taken for granted. And look, I'm fresh off covering the Surfside track, still covering it from here, from home base, but I was down there for several days. I went down with the clothes on my back when I left Jacksonville to head toward South Florida, I thought maybe a handful of people would have passed away. I, I, at that point, we had heard about all these people that were unaccounted for, but I, I think so many of us, myself included, believed, oh, maybe they're at the hospital. Maybe they don't have their cell phones. They just need to get reconnected with their family members. And as I'm down there and as I see the scope and the magnitude of this tragedy, it dawns on me hour by hour and day by day that, wow, I don't think that there's going to be a happy ending for all of these missing people and for their family. And to see that firsthand and to see people getting rushed to the hospital because of the heat exhaustion, because of the, the mental anguish that they're going through is painful. And I remember after that, I had worked very, very long days, like 20 something hour days. And finally, when I, I got an evening after my live shots in the evening where they have to be on at 10 and 11 o'clock at night, you can get a meal and catch up on some sleep. I had friends that were down in Miami beach. It's a fun place. They had a hotel room, come down, celebrate our birthdays. We've got dinner reservations. And then we're going to go to this place and celebrate and have fun. And I said, I'm sorry, respectfully, I just can't. I've seen so much pain. I've seen so much hurt. And there's so many families that are still doing it. I just really can't live with myself like that. Now, given you, you got to get back to real life, you, mm -hmm. you gotta get back and for your own mental health, you've got to be able to go to the gym, go out to dinner with your friends and family members, relax a little bit, sleep, and I think that that's a hard thing to do because I do have what some might label as survivor skill, right? Where you see such horrible things, your clothes still smell like the fire and like the dust and the debris. You bag it up so that you don't smell it in your hotel room and on your drive home. 
and then you come back and you're a couple hours away and things are pretty darn normal. And it's a hard gap to cross and to fill. And I think you just mentioned something really important because it's it's something probably, you know, people that aren't journalists think about. Um, and it's like the senses, the smells, like after an explosion, after a fire, um, every time you smell that again, it, it kind of becomes a trigger. I mean, I know it's happened to me in the past um, where the smell of fires or explosions has triggered those emotions after covering hard stories or hard news where there was a lot of, of death involved. Um, Vic, so this is probably a really personal question, but a lot of the journalists that I've spoken to all tell me like the best thing that I've done for myself is seek help and just have a therapist. Have you ever um, had a therapist, psychologist? I'll be honest, I have not. I have interviewed them after mm -hmm. experiences, but I've always done it on the viewer's level and the reader's level, a whole um, I have not, and I'm not saying that that's a good or a bad thing. Yeah. Just stating the fact here. Yeah. It, it just is. Do sure. you think um, that maybe, I mean, have you ever felt the need to speak to somebody about these experiences? Yeah, and, and I think I, I, I do have some some great friends and family members mm -hmm. to talk to. Um, I grew up in a medical family. so. Okay. I grew up around trauma, okay. unfortunately death, but my dad is a physician and he would take me to the hospital as a very young kid and I would go and do rounds with him and I would see some patients that weren't doing so well and I would come back a week later and ask where that patient was and they'd no longer be with us. And my mom is a nurse, my aunts are, four of them are trauma and ICU nurses down in Miami. Mm -hmm they see the gunshot wounds, they see the car crashes, they see the violence. And most recently over the past year and a half, they've seen COVID and they have had, I have one aunt who worked the COVID unit in the ICU. She saw her countless of people die. And um, so I think just in, in my whole family, we are, accustomed to being around trauma. We're not desensitized to it. Right. We are certainly exposed to it. And um, that's just been something since I was a, a child that I saw it, I heard about it, I learned about it. Yeah. And going back to the story you, you told us about your friends in, in South Beach, um, I mean, sometimes I think it's just normal to take a day to process all the emotions, all the energy, you know, what, what you just witnessed. Um, but what's another way that maybe you cope with emotions after covering these kinds of tragedies? So what I like to do is before I leave, because it's always emotional to leave. Mm -hmm. Emotional for me to leave Surfside. It was emotional for me to leave Parkland, Pulse the Bahamas, it, everywhere that I've been. I try to take a few minutes and ask my photographer and my producer to just give me a few minutes to go down and, and to sit there. And I still remember sitting on the lawn for the Memorial of Pulse mm -hmm. and also Parkland after a vigil, sitting by you know the crosses, the stars, the flowers, the teddy bears, the cards. And just taking it in as myself, off duty, not recording it, not taking pictures, mm -hmm. just sitting there and taking off the reporter hat and leaving the microphone and the camera behind in the car and just going up there and sometimes just sitting on the grass, Indian style, and praying, reflecting listening, taking it in, it's, it's humbling. And it, in a way, I, I think is, is healing. Because you know this, when you are reporting on something like that, I mean, I'm working morning, noon, evening, night, 
sleep for a couple hours, even though you can't sleep because your brain is reeling from what you've seen, what you've heard, what you don't know, but you're still curious about. I mean, you're, you're just going and sometimes you're going for a week straight before you get a chance. So being able to take 10 minutes just to unpack things, I think has been helpful for me. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. Um, and without realizing it, I think I, you know, I do the same thing sometimes after certain tragedies and you just kind of brought it to my attention and it's just like sitting down honoring the victims, honoring the tragedy. And yeah, I agree, it's completely healing. Um, that's so powerful. And that's, that's an amazing way to cope with certain hard stories. Um, have you ever had concerns like with your physical health or mental health after certain coverages? I have certainly thought about my mental health I'm thankful to have a good support system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are triggers, there are things. And, and when I go by certain places, you know, when I'm in Orlando and going through downtown, mm -hmm. I think about Pulse. I, I couldn't get over the fact when I was there, and this was before they were able to remove the, the bodies of the people who had passed away that I was sitting a block away and I could see the building and I was just very, I don't know if the word is, is shocked or it was just, it was a, a deep saddening thought to think that inside were 49 crime victims who thought they were going out for a night of fun with their friends and, and their bodies were still dead there it was hard to look at Parkland, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, and know that young, innocent children, as well as administrators and staff, lost their lives there. And it's something as simple as a school where all of us have gone, where all of us could have been victims. Uh, and then to look at the hotels or the community centers where the family members are being housed is, is certainly sober. Mm -hmm. And when I was down in Surfside, to look at that pile of debris that just looks like a mound of junk and to realize that there could be more than 100 bodies under there, it's hard to take in. And sometimes we in the media as a whole don't necessarily show enough respect because we're trying to get our jobs done. When you're there, you're fighting for a spot to be able to get your camera and your tripod in there to be able to do your live shots. And then you've, of course, got the networks and they're coming through with their bagels and coffee and they have all the resources possible for the evening anchor that's doing his or her live shot there. And people are, are bumping to get the shot and Sometimes you'll see reporters, producers, photographers that might laugh or chuckle or, you know, go back to some sort of normalcy. And for some of these men and women, this is what they do, especially the, the people on the national scale. They just fly pretty much from disaster and tragedy to disaster and tragedy. So, you know, I, I certainly don't blame them, but we as a whole need to be need to be better at respecting not just the dead, but, but the family members, because it can give us a bad look if you are an onlooker, a neighbor or a relative, and you see people just mulling about like they're on the job anywhere else. Um, I'm always cognizant of it. And I'll see friends from across the country and people I haven't seen for years and things like that. And sure, certainly you'll go up and you'll shake their hand and you'll talk to them. But um, I, I have to be aware that we have to set an example and, and we can't go on TV talking about how terrible something is and then sit back and relax in our lawn chair. And some people do and um, nobody's perfect, but we can work on that as a whole as journalists. Yeah, and speaking a little bit about that, I mean, I completely agree with you and I, I know 
you know, while I don't justify it, I know that sometimes we're running around so crazy to meet deadlines um, that it's easy to, to forget um, to be more respectful or mindful of the situation and, and where we're at. Um, but part of Media Healers is, is helping the world understand that we're humans too. And that, you know, even though it's our job to tell the stories and pretend like everything is okay when you have to go live, uh, we do take it home, like you said, sometimes yeah. we do have to cope with emotions and, and the tragedy. How do you feel about people, um, you know, criticizing the media or calling us fake news? And, and what do you think we can do better as journalists to gain that trust back? I hate the idea of fake news. I hate the whole narrative. It is bad for our democracy. It's bad for our well-being. I mean, you need the free press. We have the First Amendment here. And I, 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 people that want you just to sit down and worship a government leader, I, I say, you know, this is communism. You have to have journalists to keep them in check. And it's not about political party. It's, it's anybody in a position of power needs to be kept checked. And they're not their mouthpieces. And whether you're the president or the governor or a city council member, you need somebody to watch out for you because you are hired and working for the people. Um, look, there are certainly people that put their political views into their reporting, that put their personal beliefs into it. But what I try to point out to outsiders is CNN is known to be left. Fox News is known to be right. They are cable networks. They are different from local news that is over government airwaves. And if you are allergic to seafood, don't go to a seafood restaurant. If you are a vegetarian, don't go to a steakhouse. If you don't want to hear what CNN or Fox News is telling you, don't. But you have to understand these are private businesses and they do share their opinions on a lot of their programming. And I wish people would fully understand the difference between the opinions there and the hard news that we are doing in our morning newscasts on our six o'clock news. And people lump us in. And I think that that's dangerous with anything when it comes to a religion, an ethnic background, um, socioeconomic status, you cannot lump people in. And oftentimes it's the same people that lump us in as the media, but they don't want to lump all police officers in or all politicians. In. And I, I think everybody deserves a sort of individuality. And when I get angry emails or messages, or sometimes people confront me in I'll say, hi, I'm Vic, have we met? And they'll say, you're fake news, you're so liberal, you're so left-leaning, blah, 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 blah. And I say, please send me a link. Please send me a clip where I did that and I'd be happy to address it. And if there's a concern, we can talk about it. I don't ever get a response. Or they'll send me a clip or a link from a reporter that's not even with my station, right? What, what am I gonna do there? And you brought up the point that, that we, are, we are humans, especially in local news. Look, I report on things that happen half a mile from my home. I ride my bike. I go for runs past these scenes where these things have happened. I see the sheriff, the police chief, the firefighters out and about. I, <laughs> you can't burn everybody. When, when you live in a certain area. Um, I have to deal with these people again and again. And I thankfully have been able to build up trust with them and they know it. And it's not always gonna look good for their agency or their department or their office, it's not. If you are a sheriff and you have 2000 police officers, somebody's gonna do something that is not 
up to your department standards. Um, but I think that they know that I'm going to give them a fair shake. And, and the same with these tragedies. I'm not looking at something for clicks. I'm not looking at something for shares on social media. I'm not looking at something for recognition. I'm looking at it to give the truth and to inform the public on, on what I think the public needs or deserves to know, or at least if they want to know, they, they can get it. And most recently, we had a case that got national attention, 13-year-old uh, cheerleader goes missing. She's found dead with 117 stab wounds in the woods. Her schoolmate is arrested. He's 14 years old. This is in a very nice neighborhood, a prominent neighborhood, one of those places where the moms and dads say, oh my gosh, I never expected it to be here. Yeah. It was, and it made national news. And I got millions upon millions of interactions on my social media for this case. And some were respectful and some were not. And some were actually attacking me and my organization for our reporting. Yet I was in contact with the sheriff. I was in contact with the lead detective. I was in contact a few days later with the family of the victim. And I treated them all with respect and they gave me respect back. So the people that were commenting that we were heartless, that we didn't care, um, really had no factual basis. And I don't think people understand that a good journalist is not just going to throw things out and, and we're gonna carefully consider it because I was live on TV when they found the alleged murder weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and I made it abundantly clear that we were, we were in the woods and, and we, I waved over the lead detective and I said, we're here, are we okay? to get this video, are we okay to go live? Like, I'm a surprises guy. It's not, gotcha journalism is not my style. Yeah. And, um, and I was in contact with the family. The family didn't talk on the record, but they would send me notes and they would send me messages and they would ask me questions and I would do the best. And, and we tried to alert them before development would come out in the case. And um, that just goes back to having concerns for, for other people and, and realizing that, and you see this, especially with journalists that are starting out, that the ones that take selfies at crime scenes yeah, and they do TikTok dances or whatever it is. I mean, realizing that while it's a job for us, this is the worst day of someone's life. And I agree. you have to think of that. And some people in, in journalism have given us as a whole a bad name. And that's where we've gotten the fake news and the you don't care and you only care about clicks and ratings and things like that. Um, and there are people in my market who I despise of their tactics around tragedy. There are certain people that I literally my blood boils when I see them around a tragic situation. Um, but I can say that, that my organization, my colleagues, uh, we, ha we have respect and we do our best. We're not perfect. We're not perfect, but, but you know, we, we try and, and we try to keep each other in check too. Yeah. Because sometimes you could be the reporter and something could come out as insensitive. And in our newsroom, we have empowered people to, to come forward, no matter what your position is you know, from your first day on the job to being the general manager of the company, you can interject and you can say, hey, that just doesn't seem right. And at the very least, we're going to discuss it. Yeah. And I mean, who is perfect? So sure. I think the important thing is that, that we're trying to do better every day. Um, Vic, some words of wisdom you've picked up along the way that maybe you want to leave your fellow journalists with or the world, whoever's listening. Get involved with nonprofits, charitable organizations, uh, religious groups, if you're into that. Um, I do all of the above. I 
have found a lot of peace. And there are going to be days when you're on a horrible story and you don't feel like you make a difference. And the truth is, you might not really be making a difference. Um, if it's a, a horrible murder-suicide, you, you might not make much of an impact covering it. Um, you try to follow up, right, and, and talk to domestic abuse counselors and try to put out the red flags and the warning signs to, to warn people in the future. But, but there are times when you might not feel like what you are doing is that worthwhile. Well, I learned this very early on from the spouse of, of one of our on-air personalities here, and, and she said, do as many charity events as you can. And I have done that. And I, I really have a reputation of not saying no. And I could be working, going in at work at 2.30 in the morning, uh, like I was doing last week, yeah. and working until 1 p.m., and then going straight to a special needs school to teach kids how to ride a bike. And one, you're, you're using your position um, to, to get out there and, and to show people that you are a part of the community and you're not just an onlooker and to be involved. And, and two, you're gonna get it back. And it's good for the soul, it's good for your mental health. There can be defeating days and then you are at the special needs school and a kid that couldn't ride a bike is riding a bike in front of you because you helped them. Um, or you connect with somebody. And, and I have dozens of, of people in our community, probably hundreds that, that I keep up with almost on a daily, regular basis that just send me a message. And it just wants you to say, hey, have a good day. You know, I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you here, there. And um, or they want to vent about whatever it is. And, you know, a lot of the things that we do as a member of the investigative team doesn't make TV and doesn't make the web. A lot of issues we can solve. And sometimes I'll tell people, I can help you by connecting you with this person and I don't have to report on it. I just happen to know this because I'm, I'm in the industry and I, I have these connections and I can get you in um, with somebody that can help you out and we don't have to make a fuss about it. So, um, you know, do what you can and, and help out. And I think that that is certainly good for you. And I, I always host the, the special needs prom, mm -hmm. Shine with the Tim Tebow Foundation. I do a lot of events with Dreams Come True. I just signed on to do another one with them. And that kids with um, life-threatening illnesses. And to be able to do that and, and to use your platform is, is the best part about the job. And, and at the times when I've thought about walking away, which I have thought about walking away. I think we all have plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> Look, there's, there's more money, there's more vacation days, there's more rest, and there's less stress out there. Um, I've had the cushy corporate jobs or where I can sit and, and do things that are a lot less draining and straining and, uh, you know, be off work at a certain time and take these vacation days and work remotely while I'm on the beach in Mexico. Um, and then you go and you do something and you make a difference and you raise awareness for an issue or you meet some people or you help out a viewer that has literally watched you every day for the past 10 years. And it's like, okay, all right. I think I'm in the right place right now. Yeah, that's and, amazing. Yeah, right? And and if there's one thing um, I think the world should know is we definitely don't go into the field uh trying to be rich because there's jobs out there like waitressing that sometimes pay even more than what we make um especially if if you're in a local news station so um and i love that you are involved with those kinds of events as well and the charities because it's i mean your face just lights up when you talk about it so i think that while some journalists search for um, um, you know, counseling or mentors and stuff like that to cope with tragedies or, or their mental health. I think this is what, what lights up your, your days after covering hard news. I love it. And you see a lot of people cope with it with drinking or partying or, or even drug use. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's healthy. I don't think that it's, it's good for you. 
Um, I always tell young people, well, just last week, I was telling a, a reporter that's relatively new here. I was like, I know you're stressed out. You're working nights and weekends and, and you're seeing a lot of stuff. Come volunteer with me. Come break away from it. And um, it helps you. It helps the community. And, and it's just, it's been the biggest blessing for me to, to be able to do that. And, and that's why no matter how tired I am, no matter how booked up I am, I have booked flights to fly back the morning of to do a charity event leaving vacation because it, it means that much to me. And, and I think that it, it helps me in the long run when I am down doing these, these horrible, horrible things. That's awesome. Covering these horrible, horrible things, not doing them. <laughs> <laughs> not committing them. Not yeah. Them. <laughs> That's awesome though. That's awesome. Um, Vic. And lastly, um, you know, words of advice or something you'd like to improve in the industry. Um, be kind, be humble, and be a human, and put yourself in, in somebody else's shoes. We all could be the victims of a tragedy. We all could lose a loved one or, or have something horrible happen, and, and we have to think about it. And I think that, especially early on, you're raised to get that exclusive interview, right? Get that big interview. Get that family to talk do that door knock. And I, I, I put serious thought into the potential benefit there. And um, thankfully, with social media, sometimes we can reach out to people. And I'll tell you that I'll reach out to a family member in a tragedy and I'll say, hey, I'm thinking of you. I wanted you to have a personal contact at my station. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address. I know you're going through a lot. No obligation to respond, but if you need somebody, if you wanna talk, if you have any questions, if there's anything that can help you with this case, reach out to me. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes you hear from people right away. Sometimes you never hear from them. And then there's other times when they will surface out of the blue after a couple of months and they'll say, look, the timing wasn't right, but I appreciated your note and I'm ready, I'm ready to talk. Um, don't force anything on anybody. I don't ever wanna live with regret. I do everything very carefully. Um, I was talking to a friend yesterday because I've been reporting on her best friend's homicide case. It's a very easy case. And she was worried about what some people said. There was speculation. There was hearsay. And I said, listen, I'm not going to put anything out there that is not a documented part of this case. I'm not going to put anything out there that could get in the way of the police investigation. Um, but it's about opening that line. And, and there will be times, uh, like that homicide case that I covered a, a few months ago, where I still have yet to interview the family and I may never interview the family, yet I exchange notes with the family. I've met the family, I've hugged the family, I have shaken their hands and they reach out to me with their questions and their concerns. And it makes me feel so much better about my reporting to know at least that the family approves of what I'm doing. And the family is okay with what I am doing. And I'm not just doing a bleeds at leads headline and I'm not exploiting this horrific case um, because that's always a moral dilemma for me with, with anything. Is it necessary to put out all of these horrific details, especially when it comes to a child's death? Are you actually educating the public, raising awareness, potentially making something safer, or are you just exploiting a horrific, gruesome thing? And look, you and I, uh, you're definitely younger than me, but we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're somewhat in the same generation. For sure. Where, um, young people love crime shows and they love crime podcasts and they glamorize it almost. And 
I have done crime shows and podcasts for documentaries, for big name radio hosts, TV shows, things like that. And I've also turned them down because there's a time and a place and other people's pain and suffering should not be entertainment. Should not. And most recently with that case I was talking about, I had um, Nancy Grace's producer reached out. Okay. They wanted me on the show and it was the day of her memorial service. And would it have been good for my career? Would it have, you know, gotten my name out there more and, and potentially, you know, gotten me social media traction? Yeah. It wasn't right. It wasn't right for the time being. It wasn't right for the circumstances. It wasn't right. Um, just given the nature of, of some of the things that, you know, her, her stories. And uh, I politely declined. And I don't regret it. Haven't heard back either. <laughs> um, you know, we're human first. Yeah, good for you. And I'm not doing it for, and, and down in, in Surfside, I was very, very careful to, you know, every picture, every post was, was about the victims and the search crews and the facts. And um, a couple people next to me did post pictures where they're, they're at the scene and, and this and that. And, um, pictures of themselves. And, and I actually saw one, one group kind of posing for a picture. And um, it's not, not the way I look at things. Okay. Vic, is there anything else you'd like to add that maybe I didn't ask you? No, no, I appreciate the conversation. Hopefully I didn't ramble on too much for you. No, you were great. You were great. You, I can tell you're a journalist. You're a great storyteller. <laughs> so um, a lot of times I will uh, do kind of like an after action report. Yeah. And I, I haven't really done one for Surfside, but where I, I put in, you know, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the things that don't make it into my TV stories. Okay. Uh, and, and those have done really well for me. Uh, and I've been able to build a lot of people um, that like the transparency, the human touch, the emotions. Um, it just shows that you're not somebody that's coming down there to check off an assignment or a story. And um, I've done fairly well posting that. And, um, and I'm going to continue to. Um, is that on your Instagram? Facebook page. Facebook page? Okay. Yeah. If you want to message me, there's a lot of Facebook pages, but um, you'll see things where, where I just post the first person account. And, um, you know, some things that I, I just don't have time to put on TV or I'm not articulate enough to say off the cuff. And when you think about it and you write it, and a lot of times I'll write these at like 1 a.m. on my iPhone sitting in bed because I can't sleep. But um, people seem to like it. And, and it seems to change some opinions to let them know that you're not just a talking head. Um, and there are some reporters that are talking heads. And there are some reporters that are not respectful and they're not um, thoughtful. And I can say that about people that, I see, you know, here, even in our own market and on all these national stories, because you see a lot of the same people. Um, but then there's also some really good, genuine people. And uh, I can say that about my colleagues and I can say that about a lot of my competitors too. A lot of my competitors, I would trust with the most sensitive of stories. And, um, you know, there are good people in this industry. Not, every, not everybody, but there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think like anything, it's a big industry and it's hard to say everyone is 100% um, moral or ethical or has values and it's just, it's it comes with the job sometimes, but, but I agree with you. There's, I do think there's more um, good, moral, ethical journalists um, than there are those who are just looking for clicks or likes or, or to become famous off of a sure. headline. Yeah. And you can tell, usually. 
You, you can definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. Vic, thanks so much again for sharing your story with us. Sure, sure. Journalists, this one's for you. To help you heal, to help you understand your worth, and to help you know you're not alone. So share the love and subscribe to Spotify and YouTube and follow us on Instagram. The Awakened Journalist is proud to present Media Healers by Emiliana Molina Fajardo.